next passage we'll look at is Acts 8.37. Acts 8.37 is not found in the NIV. Acts 8.37 is not found in the New Living Translation. Acts 8.37 is not found in the English Standard Version. And again, the New American Standard includes it and puts a footnote that the early manuscripts do not contain this, which is a lie. And in the King James Bible, it says, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered I, and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So, just so happens that the Vatican text rips out the requirement for baptism that you be a born-again believer. Just as Rome itself teaches and practices. And your new versions have Philip baptizing a eunuch who has not even professed to be saved. The last one we'll look at, and by the way we could go on and on, and in James 5.16 in the NIV we read, Therefore confess your sins to each other. The New American Standard says, Therefore confess your sins to one another. The New Living Translation says, Confess your sins. The English Standard Perversion says, Therefore confess your sins. The King James Bible says, Confess your faults. Anyone who knows anything about the priest and the confessional knows why the Vatican text would corrupt this text to say, Confess your sins instead of confess your faults. We are not to confess our sins to man. We are to confess our sins to Jesus Christ. And if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That's a reference to confessing your sins to God, not to some man who calls himself Father. But that is an obvious Vatican corruption that appears in Vatican versions taken from the Vaticanus text. Uh, the Vatican fundamentalists, those are um, professing evangelicals who defend the Vatican versions, they stoop to childish responses. And um, some are just absolutely ridiculous, like this one um, that I'm going to address. And that is to claim that the King James Version is itself a Roman Catholic Bible. And what they do is they create a moral equivalency uh, between the use of the Vatican Bible itself to produce new versions. They equate that with the fact that there have been some who are technically um, Roman Catholic uh, individuals who have contributed to the King James Version. Uh, but there's a huge difference. Number one, we're talking about the difference between the Roman Catholic Church and its own Vatican Bible as compared to individual Catholic people. We're also talking about the difference between Catholic influence serving the Pope as compared to those who contributed to the King James Bible. They were working in defiance of the Pope. So we've just put together a few facts that we want to run through just to demonstrate why these, this argument demonstrates their desperation. They are defending the Vatican. These people who claim to be evangelical and fundamentalist Christians are on the wrong side of the major issue in these end times. And their conscience, um, some of whom uh, seem to have a conscience seared as with a hot iron, but nevertheless, their conscience is getting the best of them. They know deep down inside that when they stand before the Lord on Judgment Day, they're going to answer, especially if what you've seen on this video is true. And we assure you it is. So is the King James Version a Catholic Bible? Here are some of the uh, people who are pointed out to have been Roman Catholic who contributed to the King James Bible. First of all, we have John Wycliffe. 
John Wycliffe was a 14th century Roman Catholic priest and he worked against the Pope, uh, translating the Vulgate, which was in Latin, into English in 1384 AD, giving people the Bible in English. And yes, it was from a corrupt Vulgate, but Wycliffe gave it to them in English and then made uh, some important changes and at least produced um, the gospel of Jesus Christ and the clarity of the Bible to an extent that people began to question the Pope. Now, does it sound like John Wycliffe was serving the Pope? No, he was in defiance of the Pope, and his converts were later called Lollards, but by some, the followers of John Wycliffe were simply called Bible men. And these Bible men, or Lollards, were one of the most powerful anti-Vatican, anti-Pope forces in the world in the 14th century. And so we uh, accept their contribution to our King James Bible um, gladly and with honor and uh, pride in what they did. Now Wycliffe himself, um, in his writings, he uh, wrote little tracts that were published and uh, other uh, books and in his speeches and messages. He uh, attacked the church rule over the state. Um, he attacked indulgences as simony or religious theft. He was outspoken in the separation of church and state powers, which would uh, make him very Baptistic in his views. And by the end of his life, he was equating the Pope with the Antichrist. He spent the last decade of his life fighting the Vatican. Uh, his writings influenced men like Jan Hus, who spurred the so-called Hussite movement which also helped to pull people out of Rome into independent local churches. If we are to consider Wycliffe's influence proof that the King James Bible is a Catholic Bible, then explain this. The Council of Constance declared Wycliffe a heretic and damned his soul. The Council ordered his books to be destroyed. This Council also caused Wycliffe's bones to be exhumed and burned and that his ashes to be dumped in the River Swift, which took his ashes to the ocean and out to the world, just as Wycliffe's Bible had spread the gospel throughout the world. Another point they make is to mention the Complutensian Polyglot Bible, uh, that was supposedly published in 1517 AD. The problem is um, it was not used in the King James translation. It was published after Erasmus' Greek text. It was never used for any major purpose. And this is just another ridiculous, pointless thing to bring up because they're grasping at straws. The Complutensian polyglot has nothing at all to do with the King James Version. One might call this a red herring argument. Now, of course, the uh, Vatican fundamentalists defending their Vatican Bibles, like the English Standard Version, the NIV, the New American Standard, all of these Vatican translations, um, they will always point out that Erasmus uh, produced the Greek text that was basically used uh, to translate the King James Version. What they don't tell you is that during his lifetime, which was from 1466 to 1536, in that 16th century, Erasmus wrote scathing attacks on Rome and the Pope. He also was offered the position of Archbishop, but he turned it down because he knew the Pope was going to try to silence him um, by using this political act of intrigue. Um, people today also deceitfully call Erasmus a humanist. It's purely dishonest because they know people will think humanist, that means he's an atheist. And by humanist in the 16th century, it meant he was a humanitarian and that he believed in the humanities and education, uh, not that he was an atheist. And so people, you can see the dishonesty in the way these people put forth their arguments. Uh, history acknowledges that Erasmus was not martyred simply because of his social status. It's just like John the Baptist, who had to be killed by Herod because the, the 
Pharisees and the Sadducees couldn't kill John the Baptist because they feared the people. Well, in the same manner, the Pope couldn't kill Erasmus because he feared another revolt as had happened a couple of hundred years earlier in the Peasants' Revolt. And so for political reasons, the Pope allowed Erasmus to live out a full life. And when he died in 1536, Erasmus was buried in a Protestant church. Most of what I just told you, you will never hear the Vatican fundamentalists defending the Vatican versions ever mention. They have an agenda. They are grasping at straws and they're making straw man arguments. And as we're pointing out, we're showing there were individual Roman Catholics in defiance of the Pope who did have an influence on the King James Version. But those producing Vatican versions are using the Pope's Vatican Bible and they are serving the Pope. Get that difference. Of course, they point out that William Tyndale, who lived from 1494 to 1536, was a Roman Catholic. Um, the problem is that Tyndale also defied his church and defied the Pope and the Rome's laws. And he translated the Hebrew Masoretic text and the Greek received text of Erasmus into English. And he was condemned by the Pope for doing so. And he fought with Rome um, and he fought with his life. At one point, Fox's Book of Martyrs recounts a debate that Tyndale had with a priest from Rome, and the priest said, we had better be without God's laws than the Pope's, end quote. Tyndale responded and said, quote, I defy the Pope and all his laws, and if God spares my life, ere many years, I will cause the boy that driveth the plow to know more of the scriptures than thou dost, end quote. Now, does that sound like a good Roman Catholic? He's just spoken in defiance of Rome and the Pope. And he spent his life fighting against the Pope and against Rome. But in 1535, Tyndale was arrested and imprisoned. And in 1536, the same year that Erasmus died, the Pope had Tyndale strangled and burnt at the stake. Now look at how dishonest these Vatican version defenders are to label the King James Bible a Roman Catholic Bible to protect themselves and their precious Vatican versions and point at people like William Tyndale, men who not only fought Rome with their lives but gave their lives, was strangled and burned at the stake. This is a sickening and disgusting attempt to defend the Vatican versions. Any man who uses this argument, if he's not completely ignorant, he is dishonest and cannot be trusted. And finally, of course, uh, some accusations are leveled at King James. He declared the King of England head of the English church and rejected papal authority. Now both positions, the popes and the kings, are wrong, but nonetheless, it demonstrates that James was not a royal Roman Catholic, as some have claimed. James hated the Vatican and its head, the Pope. Now, we're just going to provide you a few quotes from King James. In uh, what's called a premonition to all most mighty monarchs, he says, quote, Rome is the seat of the Antichrist, end quote. Now, doesn't that sound like a good Roman Catholic? Uh, he also made a speech in 1605 to Parliament, and he says, quote, Popery is indeed the mystery of iniquity, end quote. Again, equating the Pope with the Antichrist. Um, in his uh, commentary on the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 10, he comments, quote, The Pope is Antichrist, end quote. And he also says, quote, Antichrist and his clergy, not only infect the earth, but rule also over the whole." End quote. Now not only is that a wonderful testimony to the fact that Rome is the whore of Revelation 17, but would you call this man a good Roman Catholic saying the things he's saying? Doing the things he's doing? Not unless you were a dishonest Vatican fundamentalist defending your Vatican versions.
uh, King James said again in his uh, premonition to all most mighty monarchs, quote, the scripture forbiddeth to worship the image of anything that God created, end quote. Thus, James did not support uh, the groves that you see at the Catholic churches and people praying to Mary and crossing themselves and doing the rosary and all that sort of thing. This King James was not a very good Catholic. Finally, in his A Premonition to Almost Mighty Monarchs, he asks a very good question. He says, quote, Is it a small corrupting of the scriptures to make all or the most part of the Apocrypha of equal faith with the canonical scriptures? End quote. And that is just one more proof that the reason the Apocrypha is in between the Old and New Testaments in the King James Bible is that the Apocrypha were uh, provided as a connection between the Old and the New. Most of your Bibles have an intertestamental uh, statement between the Old and New Testaments, especially if it's a study Bible. And that's exactly the purpose the Apocrypha served. And right there, King James says that there was never an intention, including the Apocrypha in the King James Bible, there was never an intention uh, to equate it with the canonical scriptures. We must reiterate that these Vatican readings in the new versions are no accident. And by comparing the quotations from Eldon J. Epp, a pro-Alexandrian scholar, with the quotations from David Sorensen, a pro-King James author, we can see that there is agreement that these new versions are Vatican versions, beginning with the fact that Westcott and Hort used Vaticanus as its base text. Eldon J. Epp, writing in the foreword to the Westcott Hort Greek text published in 2007 by Hendrickson Publishers, says, quote, the major differences between the two editions, he's referring to Tischendorf and the Westcott Hort text, resulted largely from Tischendorf's understandable preference for Sinaiticus, in contrast to Westcott Hort's preference for Vaticanus. End quote. Compare that quote to David Sorensen's quote from his book, God's Perfect Book, page 157. He says, quote, Tischendorf's work in copying Vaticanus made its way to none other than Westcott and Hort, who immediately incorporated it into the development of their new Greek text. They relied heavily upon it, and approximately 90% of the Westcott and Hort text is based thereon." End quote. It is irrefutable and undeniable that the Westcott-Hort text is Vaticanus with edits, and we could say that birds of a Vatican feather flock together. Again, Eldon J. Epp, from the foreword to the Westcott Hort text published in 2007 by Hendrickson, quote, Incidentally, the two Greek New Testaments currently used most widely, the Nesualan Novan Testamentum and the Greek New Testament, which is Westcott Hort, share a common text. And the text, with few changes from the earlier Nessel editions over 80 years, also stands closer to that of Westcott Hort than to any other edition. This suggests that the text of the Greek New Testament used over the past 130 years has remained relatively stable." End quote. The bottom line? Anyone denying that the new versions come from Greek texts which are basically Vaticanus with edits is either ignorant or dishonest. David Sorensen, again from his book, he says, quote, Westcott and Hort, their work in publishing a critical text of the New Testament remains the gold standard for textual criticism to this day. That text is the basic essence of the modern critical text today. From that day to this, the modern critical text is approximately 90% Vaticanus, departing only reluctantly to Sinaiticus, with a sprinkling of other eclectic texts. Again, Eldon J. Epp, in his foreword, he said, quote, The stamp of Westcott Hort can be seen in the RV's reliance on Codices Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, and the way their textual views are reflected in the revision. In the final analysis, the Greek text behind the KJV and that which theoretically lay behind the RV differed in some 5,800 readings." Quote. Things that are different are not the same. 
Eldon J. Epp also says, quote, Naturally, Codex Vaticanus, and to a somewhat smaller degree, Codex Sinaiticus, rose above all other Greek manuscripts when documents were assessed in this way for quality, standing out as the purest and best manuscripts in Westcott and Hort's view. Notice that he says only to a somewhat smaller degree did Codex Sinaiticus rise, but Vaticanus rose above all other Greek manuscripts. In agreement with this, David Sorensen, in his book, God's Perfect Book, page 154, quote, Today, approximately 90% of the modern critical text is based upon Vaticanus, departing occasionally to Sinaiticus with a sprinkling of Alexandrinus and another 40 or so eclectic manuscripts, end quote. In another quote from Eldon J. Epp, when Westcott Hort then considered how manuscripts were interrelated, they isolated four text types, three early ones and one later derivative one. The neutral text, represented by B or Vaticanus, and Aleph, which is Sinaiticus, an ancient text characterized as relatively pure and virtually identical to the original, end quote. That is why Westcott and Hort used Vaticanus as its base text, Again, Eldon J. Epp in that forward says, quote, On the one hand, new Greek manuscripts and those transmitting early versions have altered our New Testament text, though not as much as might have been expected, end quote. And in agreement with this, David Sorensen in his book, God's Perfect Book, page 3, said, quote, The modern critical text is based primarily upon two old manuscripts which originated in Alexandria, Egypt. Approximately 90% of that text is based upon B, or Vaticanus, departing to Aleph, Sinaiticus, only occasionally. A sprinkling of about 43 other eclectic manuscripts complete its essence." The Vatican influence is very clear. For example, David Sorensen points out on page 111 of his book, quote, One of the editors of the 3rd and 4th editions of the UBS Greek text of the New Testament was Carlo Martini. What is particularly significant is that Carlo Martini was the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Milan, Italy. In 1962, he was appointed chair of textual criticism of the Pontifical Institute of Rome. Interestingly, in 1994, Time magazine listed him as a possible candidate for Pope, end quote. So you have, in your new versions, Bibles that were taken from the Vatican-based United Bible Society's text, whose editors included Archbishop of Milan, Italy, Carlo Martini, a man who could have been Pope. As we continue to research these matters, the relevant and interesting facts just continue to pile up. In the margin near Hebrews 1.3 in the Vatican manuscript, one scribe wrote a note to another scribe, which a loose translation reads, quote, You fool, can't you leave the original reading alone and not change it? Now this sort of sloppy squabbling being scribbled in the margin of the Vaticanus manuscript seems surprising only in light of the fact that uh, modern scholars pretend that the Vatican manuscript is such a wonderful piece of work. But honest scholars admit that 
Codex Vaticanus, as it's called, was altered by its revisers in the 8th, 10th, and 15th centuries. In spite of this, we're supposed to surrender our King James Bibles in exchange for this incredible mess. This would also explain why the Westminster Dictionary of the Bible says, quote, it should be noted that there is no prominent biblical manuscripts in which there occur such gross cases of misspelling, faulty grammar, and omission as in Codex B, end quote. Codex B being Vaticanus. Now here is a photo of the Vatican manuscript ending for the book of Mark. If you look closely, you will see where the last 12 verses were omitted. There is a space showing that something should be there, but the verses are simply left out. Now a friend of this ministry named Jeff Spencer alerted us to the fact that if you count the verses in your King James Version book of Mark, there are 678 total verses. But after deleting the last 12 verses of Mark in the Vatican text, you are left with 666 verses in the book of Mark in the Vatican text. As Pastor David Brown commented, in his review of the so-called great uncials, quote, I question the great witness value of any manuscript that has been overwritten, doctored, changed, and added to for more than 10 centuries, end quote. Added to these obvious examples of corruption is the fact that the type of Greek used in the Vatican manuscript is not Koine Greek. The original manuscripts are known to have been written in Koine Greek, and yet the Vaticanus, Alexandrinus, and Sinaiticus manuscripts are written in the Greek of Plato, also known as Classical Greek. So the original construction of the Vatican text appears to have been a corruption of the original Koine Greek into Classical Platonic Greek and is in reality itself a sloppy revision of the Koine Greek originals into a different form of the Greek language. Now the hypocrites defending the Vatican versions will attack King James Bible believing missionaries as they use the King James Bible as a basis for foreign language Bibles. Yet these hypocrites are themselves using a Greek text that is itself a Greek revision of the original Koine Greek used in the received text manuscripts, also known as the Antioch Bible or the Byzantine text type. And just in case you didn't know it, much of the work uh, of Bible translation in the world today is actually nothing but English-speaking missionaries or translators translating the New American Standard Version, the NIV, or one of these other Vatican versions into foreign languages. And if you're a missionary or you're a bilingual Christian who can give God's Word into another language by producing an accurate translation of the King James Bible, you go right ahead and do it. The Vaticanus text, along with Sinaiticus and Alexandrinus, only represent less than 1% of the manuscript evidence. In other words, there are 5,400 manuscripts extant, and less than 1% of those agree with Vaticanus. And yet you're supposed to throw your Bible out, throw away the received text, and adopt the Pope's Bible which represents less than 1% of the manuscript evidence. The Vatican has as its goal the overthrow of the infallible Word of God as you have it in your King James Bible. The Vatican wants to replace God's Bible with its own corrupt Codex Vaticanus with edits, and foolish evangelical Protestant
Pentecostal and Baptist scholars are helping them accomplish their work. My brothers and sisters, hats and representatives of the Christian churches and ecclesial communities and of the world religions, dear friends. This unification of world religions began in earnest when Pope John Paul II, whose real name is Carol Washtila, brought together the world's religions in Assisi in 1986. 25 years later, John Ratzinger, who goes by the stage name of Benedict XVI, regathers the religious flock in order to once again pray to what they call the same God. A new world day of prayer for peace of religions in Assisi, 25 years after the first event convened on October 27, 1986, by John Paul II. Benedict XVI announced this initiative after praying the Angelus on the Solemnity of Mary, Mother of God. During these Assisi apostate prayer gatherings, they pray to the God of this world, and the Vatican Bible plays an important role in bringing all so-called separated brethren, which refers to Protestants, Evangelicals, Pentecostals, Charismatics, and Baptists, into this Antichrist world religious unity. True unity is based upon a common faith in the true words of God, not in the acceptance of a corrupt, fallible Vatican Bible. During the ecumenical meeting on September 27th in Prague, Benedict XVI underlined that the unity of Christians is needed so as to overcome the challenges of our time. Since the Second Vatican Council, explained the Pope, the Catholic Church entered into fraternal relations with all the Eastern churches and the ecclesial communities of the West by organizing, with the majority of them, bilateral theological dialogues which has led to convergence or even finding consensus on several points, thus deepening the bonds of communion. Benedict XVI deliberated on the meetings of the International Joint Commission with the Orthodox Churches, as well as the fruit from the Anglican Communion, the Lutheran World Federation, the Reformed World Alliance, and the World Methodist Council. The common commitment to continue the relationships and the dialogue, concluded the Pope, are a positive sign which shows the intensity of the desire for unity. Benedict XVI said the road to this unity must be perceived as a moral imperative, a clear response to the call of the Lord. The quest for the restoration of unity between divided Christians cannot be reduced to a mutual recognition of differences and the achievement of peaceful coexistence. That for which we yearn is the unity for which Christ himself prayed, and which, by its nature, is manifested in a communion of faith, sacraments, and ministry. Therefore, unity, the Pope added, isn't only achieved at the level of organizational structures. The duty of Christians, he said, is to pursue the way with passion and with a rigorous and serious dialogue to deepen in mutual understanding a common theological, liturgical, and spiritual heritage through the ecumenical formation of new generations, and especially with a change of heart and prayer. In the extensive and thorough text, Benedict XVI recalls the centrality and importance of the Bible in past and present culture. Regarding the life of the church, liturgy, and the education of children and adults, the apostolic exhortation contains several suggestions which emerge from the Synod of Bishops. It calls for the promotion of reading and personal meditation, verifications with a magisterium, the development of the Lectio Divina, and to make the Word of God leaven for the renewal of the world. The first part deals with current problems from biblical interpretation and connected themes to an awareness of the universal symbolism of the Bible itself. And true unity must be based upon a common salvation by faith alone in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We will not apologize for our faith in our King James Bible and everything of which it speaks. We are saved by faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ 
but it's because of the infallible words of God that we even know what the gospel truly is. With all of the false cults and false gospels out there, we can turn to the infallible words of God in our King James Version and know what is true and what is false. And King James Bible believers will not be going along with the modern apostasy as Protestants run back to Rome just in time for the Antichrist to appear and usher in a new world order. After seeing all of this evidence, which we could continue to present for literally hours on end, you must face the situation and ask yourself where you stand. Will you stand with the Antioch Bible, the Bible of the apostles, martyrs, great preachers and missionaries for 2,000 years? Or will you walk away from the true foundation of the Christian faith and embrace the Pope's Vatican Bible? It's time for you to answer. Whose side are you on? Thank you.